Let us pray. Father, as we come to your throne of grace this morning, Lord, we thank you that we can do so. We ask, Father, that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that you will guide and lead us as we go to your word now, Father, that we will have a closer relationship with Jesus. We thank you that we can do this, Father, worship you, and we ask that you will bless us as we do so through Christ's precious name. Amen. Seventh-day Adventists have a history in the name Adventist anticipating one day seeing Jesus soon. I can't wait. How about you? I want to see Jesus face to face. I have all kinds of questions that I want to ask him. And then I think there's just going to be that time when we sit at the banquet eating table and see all of our friends and loved ones who we've had to lay to rest. I can't wait to see Jesus. How about you? There's something about this season of year, though, that points us back to the final life in the week of Jesus. Because during that last week, of his life, I believe there was a greater intensity on his part and his desire to be with his disciples. And the teachings of that last week were intensified to the point that I believe they contain the lessons that the disciples needed to go forward. Might be a good thing to study those things which Jesus taught his disciples that the same mission and purpose that he had, his disciples would carry forward. As we are looking in the book of John, we looked last week in John chapter 11 about the raising of Lazarus and Jesus' ability to restore life and give life. And as I studied John chapter 12, John chapter 12 in many ways almost seems to be an overlay and a repetition of John chapter 11. And I'm scratching my head, and I'm saying, why, Lord, would you repeat it? And it wasn't until later in the week that I got it. And the answer was, because you didn't get it the first time. That'll catch up with you Tuesday. If it's important, he says it once. If it's really important, he says it a second time. But he says the same thing, but there's some nuanced other issues that are brought out in ways that weren't brought out the first time. So I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 12 this morning. John chapter 12. The the arc of John chapter 12, I really believe, is that it is a story about people wanting to see Jesus. We would see Jesus. Although it's first mentioned further in the chapter, as we go through the lessons of John chapter 12, just let that linger, because I believe you will find each person's story in John chapter 12 carrying that underlining theme, we would see Jesus. And it's done for different reasons and different purposes, for different teaching, <clears throat> different teaching purposes for us today. John chapter 12, verse 7. We will start there uh, this morning. John chapter 12. Well, uh, actually, John chapter 12 begins with the story um, that there was a supper that was made, and Martha served him. Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And then Mary took a pound of ointment, a spicknerd, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which would betray him, said, Why wasn't this ointment sold and the 300 pence be given to the poor? And he said, The poor you have always with you, but because because he was a thief, he had a bag, and he bare what was put therein. Interesting, isn't it? Lazarus, one 
who was raised from the dead. Jesus comes to supper. Mary brings the precious ointment, breaks the ointment. All she wanted to do was to glorify Jesus and worship Jesus. What a lesson. What a lesson. Coming to glorify Jesus. And what was the response? What is she doing? How can it be she's so wasteful? How can it be that she would do this? We would see Jesus. Yes, we would. We would see Jesus clear. Yes, we would. Yes, we will. In verse 7, follow along with what Jesus says. Follow along and don't miss it. Then Jesus said, let her alone. Against this day of my bearing, she has kept this. We would see Jesus and the first lesson of John chapter 12 is simply three words, let her alone. It's a strange message from Jesus, isn't it? Who was it addressed to? It was addressed to the man who brought the charge. What is this person who doesn't belong here doing anyway? She must be removed. And with full confidence, he thought Jesus was going to excuse her and affirm the fact that that money might be so, or that precious ointment could have been sold and the right thing be done. John chapter 12 is a story that sets men on their heels, and rightly so, because the message is, let her alone. but it applies in many different ways also. When people come to Jesus and want to worship and glorify Him, who are we to say that they cannot come? Who, how dare us in our well-meaning, meaning, meaningfulness, in our well-meaning, think that we know who should worship how they should worship, who should be allowed to worship. The first message is, when people want to see Jesus, they want to come and worship, let us encourage them, let them alone. Let's follow along, John chapter 12. The second thing that I believe we find in John chapter 12 is found in verse 13. Verse 13, we would see Jesus. Oh, there was a buzz in town. It's Jesus. He raised the dead. It's Jesus. He healed the blind. Uh, he healed the blind. The blind can see. It's Jesus. The lepers were healed. It's Jesus. He's the one that can make you whole. In verse 13, they took the branches of palm trees and they went forth to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they placed him on the donkey, and he went on the donkey into Jerusalem. Two million people gathered to celebrate, and most of them missed him. Hosanna, it's Jesus. We would see Jesus. These things, verse 16 says, these things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered these things that were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him, and they sought to glorify him. A picture of a woman wanting to worship, a picture of the crowd wanting to glorify Jesus, they, they not understanding how important that would be only as they would look back and realize on that day it was about glorifying Jesus, worshiping Jesus, glorifying Jesus, not understood. But there was another group that would see Jesus. A group. A group who had come to seek out Jesus. The Jews and the Pharisees. 
would come and seek out Jesus. They would find Jesus for purposes other than glorifying and worshiping him. Because right next to Jesus was Lazarus. And the Jews didn't know what to do with Lazarus because what do you do if you're going to put down, uh, if you're going to put a movement down and there is one who's been raised from the dead, how do you deal with it? You have to deal with a person who was called back from the grave. And they didn't know what to do. We would see Jesus. They come for all different motives and they come for all different reasons. But they want to see Jesus. So where will you find yourself in the story of John chapter 12? The people were looking for Jesus. The people were longing to find Jesus. The Greeks, in verse 21, John chapter 12, verse 21, they, there's, uh, the same came therefore to Philip and said, desiring of him, Sir, we would see Jesus. Does that message burn in your heart that you want to see Jesus today? Does it resonate in your conscience thought that Jesus wants you to see him today? Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip didn't know exactly what to do. But he knew someone who knew Jesus. And so he takes them to Andrew. And Andrew knows exactly what to do. All right, follow me. Let's go to Jesus. When people are looking to come to Jesus, if you don't know what to do, find them someone who does know what to do. But we would hope that you would be able to tell them your own personal story of how you have seen and experienced Jesus firsthand. Philip comes and tells Andrew, and Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. Jesus, there's somebody here that wants to see you. Jesus' response could have been one of many. I'll see them tomorrow, maybe next week. I'm really busy. I'm just entering in quiet devotions with the Father. Verse 23, though, Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. The purpose of Jesus' life was to glorify his Father. He said, this is my purpose. He answered them saying, I am about glorifying the Father. Let them come on to me. I will share with them purpose. I will share, them, share with them what living for my Father is all about. And then he teaches them a lesson in verse 24. It's not about position. It's not about privilege. It's not about exaltation. And he says these words, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain, or it says in the King James, a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies. It, bring, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it brings forth, the Bible says what? Much fruit. And Jesus is saying in order to be multiplied, in order to live to the fullest, one must die first to live. It doesn't make common sense, does it? Until you listen to the words of Jesus and reflect on them for just a little bit. For when the, when the grain goes into the ground, it appears to be lifeless. There's a time of germination. There's the watering and slowly the plant starts to grow as its roots are deep in the soil. And what comes forth is magnificent. It's a multiplication of the life. How is it, friends? How is it that we can multiply the message of Christ? How is it that He might be glorified? Paul said, I die... I die what? Daily. Daily. Dying daily to live daily for Christ is the overlay. Glorifying Christ, dying first to live for Him, that His message might go forward. Verse 25, 
He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. But the additional piece that Jesus wanted his disciples to, to know is as you come and see Jesus, what does it really mean? What does it really mean to be with Jesus and to live for Jesus? Verse 26, if any man serve me, let him what? Deny himself and come. Come what? Come follow me. Simply, Jesus says, let, uh, let him follow me. Let him follow me. I don't know about you. When it comes to leading and following, occasionally I like to lead. I also like to follow good leaders. How about you? Wherever Jesus leads, that's where I want to go. The problem is I don't always want to go there. Now, wait a minute. Couldn't we just do this first? Couldn't I just do that? We'll get there sometime in the future, but not right now. But his timing is impeccable. He says, if any man or woman serve me, let him or her follow me, that where I am, there shall my servant be. So let me, let me just inquire ever so gently. Are you following him today? Do you start your day with some quiet meditation and prayer? Are you following him on the job site? Are you following him in, in the family circle? Are you following him in the interpersonal relationships with you, that you have with your neighbors and friends? Are you following him in your relationships within the church family? Where he is, his disciples will follow. But wait a minute, you know as well as I do, right now they're with him. Right now they're with him. Where will they be within a week? are clouds on the horizon for the disciples. But get the message right now. We would see Jesus. We would see Jesus because we want to follow him. And when we understand it's about worship and glorifying him, we will follow Jesus. That where I am there shall my servant be also. The next piece, if any man serve me, him will my what? Father, honor. Sir, we would see Jesus. Jesus' voice. If you want to follow me and serve me, my Father will honor you. I long to hear those words. How about you, friend? I long to have that close, intimate relationship with my Savior, dying to live. Following Christ, serving that we might glorify Him. Sir, we would see Jesus. Have you ever heard the voice of angels? Have you ever heard the heavenly voice? For you see, when Jesus calls and your desire is to follow Him, He always responds in the affirmative and comes to your aid, not days, not hours, immediately to your aid. And He says, here is the path. Follow me. Here is a path. Serve me. And notice, notice the response of heaven in verse 28. Jesus said, Father, glorify thy name. I like this part. Then came there a voice from heaven. Listen, a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sake. Oh, what an amazing story. And it's not just a story of thousands of years ago. Whenever somebody wants to see Jesus, he's right there. He says, Come and follow me. Come and serve me. Glorify me and my Father as I have done. And the voice from heaven you will hear as of thunder, friends. Have you heard the thunder of angels? Have you heard the voice of God saying to you, my son, my daughter, 
You seek Jesus, and I am blessing you. You seek Jesus, and He is with you. You seek Jesus, and you're glorifying Him. Verse 32. Verse 32. And Jesus said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And this He said, signifying what death He would ultimately die. The purpose of his disciples, after they seek him and follow him and serve him, is to lift him up to those who do not know him. It's to lift them up that others might be drawn onto him. They loved, um, John chapter 12 ends with a caution and a warning. One of the warnings is for, uh, to the group of people that turned away, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of, you know, the rest of that verse, more than what? more than the praise of God. There is a group of people today that do not follow Jesus. There is a group of people today that have looked at what it takes to follow Jesus, and they love the comforts of life, and they love the assurances that they have of this world, and they say, I can't go down that path. We would see Jesus if I can do it in the way that I want to do it, in the time frame that I want to do it, according to how I want to do it. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And he, verse 45, and he that seeth him, seeth him that sent him. I am the light of the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. We're called, friends, to seek Jesus. We would see Jesus. I was reflecting on that this week. Usually what happens, the message is formed and sketched and distilled and distilled and distilled. And I said, Lord, show me this week where I've seen you. Because I don't want to wait a hundred years, 50 years, 10 years, five years. Show me this week and answer that cry of my heart. Lord, I want to see you. And the quiet voice spoke to me and said, Look, look around at those you've been around. For when Jesus was here, he sought to glorify his Father. He then commissioned his disciples who were seeking to glorify Christ and our Heavenly Father. And the Spirit said, look at those who have been around you to see if you can catch a glimpse of Jesus. And I started to just reflect upon people, just a few people, who I've had contact with. I started writing down and I said, well, that's about 60 people I've had contact with individually this past week. And much, much more than that. But I think of a friend longing to be with another friend and remembering and paying their respect the deep love and the glory of Christ transforming a heart and connecting individuals. I think of a stranger simply asking. It was early one morning. I got in the elevator. I had a short night, and I'm on West Coast time. I had uh, turned in about, I don't know, midnight, and it was about 6 o'clock, and I was half awake. He was fully awake because he, he said he was traveling from the East Coast. So he was three hours, three hours more awake than I was. And it was a strange meeting. He was in the elevator and he said, oops, I'm going the wrong way. I thought it doesn't matter to me. There's only three floors on this hotel and it's got to go the direction I'm going. I'm just getting in. But he's standing there with his luggage, dressed as if he's going to the airport. And annoyingly bubbly and perky at that hour in the morning when I'm not fully awake. 
And he had been going to kind of a uh, sales meeting or some type. He had a suit on and uh, just looked like to be the type of a very outgoing, gargarious person. I wasn't feeling too much in the engagement mode. But his, his enthusiasm to embrace the day just kind of spilled over into my life. And I left the elevator saying, well, thank you, Lord, for a little, little ray of sunshine in this otherwise boring, bleak day so far. Just a little glimpse, not overtly, of the face of Christ, but seeing Jesus ever so slightly in another's person, another person's life. I think I saw three angels ministering compassionately to a dying woman this week. I saw an angel in an unlikely service manager showing kindness to people in need. I heard the voice of the angel on the telephone when said, well, what is it you need? Perhaps you need it now. I see someone who is allergic to eggs, cooking eggs for others. A little glimpse of the face of Jesus. I see a group of highly effective individuals meeting together. How can we reach a community for Christ? I see the face of Jesus. I see the angels of Jesus when a joyous four-and-a-half-year-old and a joyous six-year-old play together full of energy, just wanting to play and be joyous. We would see Jesus. We would see him in the distance. We would see Jesus, perhaps, if we look a little closer in the lives of people he puts us in contact with. To realize that the goodness and the graciousness in their lives is a reflection of Jesus. We would see Jesus that others might see Jesus in us.